You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week is another episode talking about financial and money questions. And I want to focus um, on the question of saving and its relationship to freedom. I've done a couple of podcasts um, in the last weeks about uh, money-related topics. I'd love to hear any feedback you have. Um, you know, I'd love to hear if people are finding it useful or other things that you'd be more interested in. Just by way of explanation, I, I do think that money is one of those topics that's really, really important and has a huge impact on the freedom that you experience in your own life. Um, but it's not talked about that much. And when it is talked about, it can often be from a very preachy perspective of, you know, this is what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing and so forth. What I'm trying to do is just talk about my own experiences with the relationship between money and freedom and hopefully um, share some of the thoughts about uh, different ways of approaching getting more financial freedom. I know that in my own experience, I didn't think about financial freedom very consciously as I started working towards it. And I hope that in talking about it in these podcasts, it can be useful for others who are thinking about how to get more financial freedom in their lives. I also want to just say, you know, I'm not a financial advisor and this isn't advice. Um, I'm just providing my opinions and my thoughts and my experience. I hope you find that interesting. But obviously what you do with your money is is your responsibility. So as I say, this week is about saving and its relationship to freedom. It occurs to me that um, when you look at the sort of traditional career path that many, many people take, there is a kind of wage slavery that people experience where as their career progresses, their incomes rise and their expenses rise in lockstep with their income. In fact, often their expenses rise faster than their income and they go into debt. But this is a pattern, a kind of very mainstream pattern, I think, which can go on for a whole lifetime where you can get into a career, start earning more money, start having more expenses, probably peak around middle age um, with the highest income and the highest expenses, and then still going into old age still be living pretty much month to month, maybe with a bit of a pension put away if, you know, if you've managed to do that. But still, um, this pattern of living month to month is a huge limit on your freedom, on your freedom to change jobs, to move towns, to experience doing different things, to start up your own business. And just not having savings is a real, real limit on the options that you have in life. So... I thought it'd be interesting to talk about saving. There are loads and loads of websites out there with tips and techniques, and I'm not going to talk about any suggestions because I, I don't think I have particularly useful tips to apply to everyone. I would like to talk about different ways of thinking about saving, how I thought about it, and what my experience was. So here's one way of thinking about it. If you want to break this pattern of living month to month, this kind of wage slavery that it's very easy to find yourself in. There's really, I think, two routes or, or two ways of focusing. And maybe you do both of them, uh, but at least in, in terms of thinking about it, I think it's useful to think about these two ways. So the first way is to really focus on increasing your earnings without increasing your expenses. And this is uh, my experience. This is what the sort of the route that I took. So what that means is that you know if you um, get into a job or you start a business, you start your own uh, entrepreneurial venture, um, your career or whatever it is, you start earning more money, but you don't scale your expenses as you start earning more money. And therefore, the gap between what it is that you're earning and what it is that you're spending gets bigger, so you have more savings to put away. And the difficulty with that is that as your job progresses, typically you do take on more and more expenses. You move into a house, you buy a car, 
you have to buy clothes for work, you start to have a more comfortable lifestyle because you, your job sort of supports it, and you probably have social expectations about the kind of money that you're going to spend at the earning level that you're at. Um, and in fact, I think those are all really important pressures on spending more money. So that's one way, and I'll talk a bit more about that because that's sort of the way that I chose. The other way of looking at this is to really focus on decreasing your expenses without decreasing your earnings. So, you know, if you are already at a certain point in your career, you might think about how you can change your lifestyle to significantly reduce your cost of living. And, you know, this again is difficult to do without impacting on your income. So, for example, one thing you could do is to say, right, I'm going to move to a really low cost country. Maybe it's going to be India or somewhere in South America or Central America or something like that. And by doing this, I'm going to massively reduce my cost of living. So I'm going to have far cheaper accommodation and food's going to be cheaper and so on. And so all of my expenses are going to be much, much lower. I'm going to sell this place that I'm in. I'm going to sell all of my uh, consumer goods and live really cheaply. That's great. But the problem with that is how can you do that without reducing your income? Because it's not necessarily going to be easy to move your job to this low cost location uh, unless you're working online or something. So the question is, what kind of income are you going to be earning in this location? And are you going to also significantly lower your income? And that applies even if you don't move countries, even if you just move from your town where you're currently located, which is expensive, to a much cheaper town in your own country. That again could have implications on what kind of work you can get and what you know what your level of income would be. So that's the other route, um, which is to focus on decreasing your expenses without decreasing your earnings. And that I think, if you want to find out more about that, I've mentioned it in, uh, previously, but the the website uh, Early Retirement Extreme um, has a lot of examples of people who are very much taking this. Uh, decreasing expenses route. They're very much focused on saving by minimizing their cost of living as much as possible. And I would strongly um, suggest that that's an interesting way of, uh, of looking at it. If, if you're interested in that path, by all means, check out that website. My own experience is more on the former route, which is increasing earnings without increasing expenses. And I think this this is a way that I understand a lot better because I can see how it works for me. So I can probably talk more um, usefully about this approach. But for me, it was pretty straightforward that when I left home, went to university and had a student lifestyle and then started doing consultancy work and getting uh, more income and eventually started my own business, I simply didn't take on an increasing level of expenses to go with with the increasing income that I was making. So, for example, I didn't buy a house, I never owned a car, and in many ways I just carried on living quite a sort of studenty lifestyle um, in terms of my expense level, whereas my income level rose and rose. And what that enabled me to do in my 20s was to save up a year of expenses in savings and that year of expenses together with some significant loans that I took out that was what enabled me to start my business now I think it is really important to acknowledge that that was the 1990s it was a time of great growth and it was a very very different economy it was a lot easier um, to get work and a lot easier to save so it is different now. We're in the Great Recession or Depression, and it's much, much harder. Uh, and I don't mean to imply at all that this is just an easy thing to do, uh, especially in today's circumstances. And I think, you know, it d obviously it depends what kind of work you do and the field that you're in, but there's definitely a, a very, very well-trodden path, a clear path that people have where they get into work they get into increasing their earnings on their career path and their expenses just 
gradually climb and climb and climb so that they may be earning more, but they're just spending more as well. So they're just not making those savings. My own experience was that I didn't really care about things like owning a car or owning a home. I was really interested in freedom and in the opportunity that having the savings would provide. And maybe at this point it's helpful to think about, you know, what the upside of doing the saving is, because it is definitely a sacrifice that you have to make in order to save. So in terms of what the benefits of the saving are, uh, when you start to save, there's two key milestones, I guess, um, one of which I already talked about and another one which is a sort of intermediary smaller milestone, but it's worth talking about. Um, when you start saving, the first is where you build up what people normally call an emergency fund. And that's probably one to three months of living expenses that you have saved in cash, readily available uh, in a you know in a bank account or in some easy savings vehicle, which is very accessible, so that you're able to have the freedom to know that whatever happens, you have got that emergency money that is going to enable you to cope with unexpected events. And unexpected events always end up happening. Whether that's a problem in your personal life, you need to move home, whether or not there's a problem with your job, that you get made redundant. If you're an entrepreneur, you have uh, a very patchy income for a while. Whatever it is, when you actually have that emergency fund built up, it takes off a huge amount of stress because it means that you know that you're prepared for any event like that that, that, would, that would force you to um, act quickly. And, you know, smaller scale emergencies, unexpected expenses that you haven't budgeted for. However good you are at budgeting, it's, there's always going to be um, issues that come up which you didn't anticipate, which, you know, just having that buffer enables you to cope with. And that could also just be a cash flow question. You know, it could be that you're an entrepreneur and you are doing well and you're getting contracts in, but you can hit a problem with cash flow where there's a delay in payments. And even though you technically think that you can, you've secured enough work or enough money to last you for the next six months, the timing of that can be absolutely crucial. And if, if the money doesn't come in a timely fashion, then you can be stuck uh, with nothing. And if you don't have an emergency buffer, that really, really can be a problem. And once you've built up that emergency buffer, the next sort of milestone, which I think is a really significant one, is when you get to build up savings that will last you for a year. So in other words, a year's worth of living expenses saved, because that provides you with a whole new range of opportunities. For example, in my case, in my 20s, I saved up a year's worth of expenses, and that gave me the confidence to start my own business. Because I knew, that, I mean, however badly this went, it could get to the end of a year and I would still be able to go back and get a job and, you know, I'd be okay. Um, and I had the opportunity to, to really go for it and try and do a venture of my own. That was what I used that milestone of a year's worth of expenses for. But I can think of so many other opportunities that it could give you. And if you have a year's worth of expenses saved up you can move anywhere on the planet i reckon that level of savings will give you an opportunity to work out how if you wanted to you could try and go and live in another country for a significant level of time and you know obviously you've got to take care of all the visas and that, that kind of situation but provided that you're able to get over all of the uh, bureaucratic hurdles the savings would enable you to make that kind of a significant life change you never have to worry about working for a really awful job because if it's terrible, you can just leave if you've got that, that buffer saved. So those are some of the ways in which I think saving provides for huge increases in the, in the level of real freedom that you experience. And my, my experience was I didn't even get into investing in any complicated assets or anything like that until I'd reached this milestone of having a year's worth of savings that was for me it was just in cash and I think this is a really more important thing to get to than trying to get all 
complicated and fancy about how you invest your savings is just actually get some savings in the first place. For me, it was a really, really great launch pad to starting a business. And I wish you all the best uh, in your own path towards getting some savings in place so that you can also launch your own business if you want to or do something else fantastic with your life just with the freedom that comes from actually saving so i hope that's helpful i'd love to hear any feedback you have any thoughts about this subject and thank you so much for listening thank you for listening to the voluntary life if you have feedback about the show please email jake at the If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.